So I want to thank you for being with us today. We are in the book of Colossians, so open up your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Colossians. If you don't have a Bible with you, just grab one out of the chairs there and uh, open right up to that. Uh, We are studying in Colossians how Jesus Christ is an all-sufficient Savior for our need to become more godly and, and a more spiritual person. I want to ask you a question, but there is a danger. The danger is that it's hard to be honest in church when you get questions like the one that I'm about to ask you. Typically, people have the standard answer that they give in church. But here is the question that I want to ask. Who would you like to be like more than anybody else in the world? I mean, if you could trade places with another person, if you could be like one person, who would you choose? Well, the danger when you ask a question like that is, is in church is that you know you're, you're supposed to give a very spiritual sounding answer. So some of you might say Jesus, but deep down inside in your heart, that might not necessarily be the answer. But it was for Paul. I believe Paul could pray with all of his heart, oh, to be like thee. That was his prayer and that was his passion for every person that he ever met or ministered to. And that's what we're going to study today in the text that we're going to look at. And my prayer and my passion is that Paul's passion becomes yours. So let's look in Colossians chapter 1, reading from your own Bible. It reads this way, beginning in verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now being disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me. Now, did you hear what Paul said his goal was? You cannot accuse Paul of settling for a small goal. He said, the goal of my ministry is to present everyone perfect in Christ. That word perfect means complete or finished, or the word that we would typically use is mature. Look at that same verse, Colossians 1.28, the latter part of that verse from the Good News Version. It says, in order to bring each one into God's presence as a mature individual in union with Christ. Now, let me ask you, are you becoming mature in Christ? What does that mean? Well, maturity means Looking more and more like Jesus. That was Paul's goal, and that is our aim, to look more and more like Jesus. And Paul said spiritual maturity is not just possible for a select few people. He believed all of the treasures of God were in Christ, and they were equally available to every Christian. He believed it was the goal, and it was the potential of every single Christian to look more like Christ. By the way, that is God's goal for you. God's goal for you is not just to save you. God's goal for you is to not just keep you out of hell. God's goal has always been to get you to look more like his son. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Paul writes, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God predestined you. God's goal for you before you were born was that you would look more like Jesus. Jesus. 
Now that verse is right after a verse that we love to quote, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, keep that verse in context. God did not promise that everything in your life would be good. What God promised is, if you love me, I will take anything that happens in your life, no matter how bad it is, and I will work it out so that when it's over, you will look more like my son. God can take anything that's happening right now in your life, and he will, if you cooperate with him, make you look more like Christ when it's all over. They tell a story about a sculptor that was working on a bronze statue. And even though it looked like it was almost finished, he just kept working on it. And every day, he'd chisel a little bit more. He'd file a little bit more. And he'd do that. And someone said, when are you going to be through? He said, I'm never through. I just keep working and working until someone comes and takes it away. You know something? God is never going to be through with you. He's going to be to be molding and, and polishing and sanding and filing and chiseling and working on you until the angels come and take you away because he's never going to settle for anything else than you looking more like his son. What is maturity? Maturity means submitting to this work of God in you. And by the way, we have a word for that. We, we call it morphine. Morphine is that word which means that I am being transformed into the increasing likeness of Christ by God's work in me. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into the likeness, into his likeness, excuse me, with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Now, I have a mission today. My mission is to get you to believe those words. My mission is to get you to believe that looking like Jesus isn't something a very few really spiritual people can ever aspire to. My mission this morning is to get every single person in this room to believe it is your goal, it is your potential to look like Jesus. That was the secret that Paul said, I will pay any price to announce this. They can put me in jail. They can beat me. I don't, I don't care. I'm going to suffer, but I'm going to get this mystery out so that people know they can look like Jesus. A little later in the book of Colossians in chapter 4, he says, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Paul uses that word mystery in the book of Colossians a lot. What does he mean when he talks about the mystery of Christ? Well, here it is. Write this down first. The mystery is that the gospel of Christ includes every person. This great plan of God to shape people into the image of his son is not exclusive to just one race or one nation or one tongue. He said in Colossians 1, God has chosen me to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. Paul would have never gone to jail if he had not preached to the Gentiles. If he had said, you know, only the Jews are part of God's plan. He would have never have suffered, but that was not the truth. There was, there was a secret that Paul had to get out to the world. And, and here's the secret. You cannot keep God's love and God's mercy to just one particular people. It is the property of the whole world. Look what Paul said about this mystery in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. What is the mystery? God wants the whole world to know that anybody can share in the promises of Christ. Anybody can. What's more, every single person 
It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what their culture is. It doesn't matter what their level of of education they have. Every single person has the potential to reflect Christ just as much as you do. Now, do we really believe that? I think our unconscious biases show up here more than we think. I think deep down, it's hard to not believe that some races and some cultures just look a little more like Jesus than others others do. Did you hear about the big flap in Virginia several years back? A, A school was putting on a gospel play, and they chose a young black boy to be Jesus. Many in the community were outraged. You can't have a black person be Jesus. Black people don't look like Jesus. Oh, really? Just who does look like Jesus? Who can look like Jesus more than anybody else? You see, that's what Paul says this mystery is. The mystery is that right now, some 85-year-old African woman under a tree listening to a missionary preach can look just as much like Jesus as you. That some teenage Asian boy right now walking along the bank of a river for 10 miles to go and listen to a missionary give a lesson looks just as much like Jesus as any boy in a youth group in Des Moines, Iowa. You ever notice that most of the movies about Jesus, that Jesus always looks like us? I think there is this unconscious bias. We, we think that, that some people just look more like Jesus, but, but Paul says, no, everybody alive can hear the gospel and God can start a work in their heart and they can all start to look like Jesus. That's the mystery. The gospel of Christ Includes every person. You say, well, how's that possible? How can can anyone look like Jesus? Well, that is the second part of the mystery, and you need to write this down as well. The person of Christ indwells every believer. Paul said back in Colossians 1, verse 27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what that means? Remember a few Sundays ago when I talked about Christ in verses 15 through 20 of Colossians 1, and and we said that he's the one that made everything. He was the one that was before everything. He was the one that everything's been reconciled to. He is the firstborn among the dead. He's the one that holds everything together. Can you imagine a more majestic, incredible person like that? And Paul says, guess what? He lives in you. He lives in you. You You don't need more than Christ. You need more faith that you have in Christ. I I told you earlier that my mission today is, is hard. My mission is to get you to believe that you can look like Jesus. And you know what? It's not going to happen until you and I believe that Jesus really does live in us. He really does. You say, well, that's hard to believe. I know it is an incredible mystery that God has revealed. Jesus Christ lives in you. That's what Paul said over in Galatians chapter two. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. John said the exact same thing in his letter, 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. But look what Jesus said in John chapter 14, the best of all. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and and we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you hear what I just said? So, so someone comes up to a Christian and they say, you know, I just, I just don't get it, man. You're, you're different. You, you, you don't do what we do. You don't talk like we talk. You don't go where we go. But, but it seems like you've got it together. What is going on with you? You know what you say? You say, well, I'll admit it's kind of a mystery. But here's the secret. Jesus Christ is living in me. He really is. He is alive in me and and I am living in him and and living through him. 
Folks, you don't need to get more than Jesus. You need to let more of your life come under the control of Jesus. A number of years ago, the Walt Disney World Company did exit polling. We hear a lot about exit polling. Well, this is the kind of exit polling I want to hear about right now. Disney World, people leaving the parks many years back. Found out a lot of people had come a long way to their amusement park in Orlando, and they were leaving disappointed. People had come from all over the country, even all over the world, and they brought their little kids, and their little kids had not seen the one person that they had come from all over the world to see. Who was that? Mickey Mouse. The Disney company is sharp. So that's when they began the practice of every single day at noon having a parade right down Main Street. And guess who led that parade every single day? Mickey Mouse. And let me tell you something. It was God's plan that you could go all over around into one of God's churches, no matter where you are in the world, and you could see Jesus. That is my goal for our church. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Now I want you to understand that the goal here is not to be a mega church or to have a big giant increase in giving, although we should give that a try. But let me ask you something. If we had a thousand people that attended here every single Sunday morning and a visitor came in and they didn't see Jesus, what good is it? What good is it? Paul said, I I am literally all torn up inside until Jesus is formed in you. So let me ask you again, if if you could trade places with with anybody on the planet, if you could pick just one person and say, you know what, that's who I want to be like more than anybody else, would you choose Jesus? Well, if you would, let me, let me tell you then what that is going to mean. Write, write these things down. First, it means that we must suffer with him who suffered for us. Look back up in your Bible at verse 24 in Colossians 1. Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. What does he mean by that? That is a strange verse. He doesn't mean that Jesus did not finish his work on the cross. That word afflictions in the Bible is never used about Jesus' work on the cross. In fact, over in chapter 2, he's going to say that there is nothing lacking in the efficacy about the death of Christ on the cross. But here is what he is saying. He is saying that what is unfinished is the task of telling the entire world about Jesus' finished work on the cross. And let me tell you something, nobody ever heard the gospel without it costing somebody something. Now, the offer of salvation is free, but it costs somebody something to deliver that message. And Paul says, I want to fill up in my flesh. I want to suffer with him who suffered for me so that the whole world can know about this mystery of Christ. He knew from the start what it was going to cost. Look, you go all the way back to Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 15. And Jesus is speaking to Ananias after Paul was converted. Look what Jesus says to Ananias. He tells him, go, go to Paul. This man, Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul understood from the very beginning that if you are going to be like Jesus, you are going to suffer. The problem is we never really fully got that message. We didn't start with that same understanding. So I'm telling you today, how can you be like Jesus if you never suffer? What good is it to be a martyr if you're going to whimper? How can you look like Jesus as long as you say, Lord, don't let me hurt. Don't let me suffer. God, don't make this too hard. I want to say to you that when you suffer, when life is hard, and when the power of Christ literally pours out, that's when the world has the very clearest idea that there is a mystery going on here. 
You want to look more like Jesus, you must suffer with him who suffered for you also. This hasn't gone one time, has it? Here's the other point. You must dwell on him who dwells in you. Paul said, we proclaim him. We don't proclaim church. We don't proclaim culture. We proclaim Christ. So let me, so let me ask you, do you regularly dwell on Christ? Now let's think for a second. When you get up in the morning time, you get out of bed. Typically, how long does it take for you before you have your very first thought about Christ? How can you look like somebody you never think about? So a little later, Paul is going to say in the third chapter of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You, you think maybe he dwells on Jesus just a little bit? Paul said, he wants you to think about Christ. He wants you to sing about Christ, to speak about Christ, to every step that you take, you do in honor of Christ. Your whole life should be obsessed with Christ. You know what he reminds me of? The story of the little boy who went to Sunday school for the very first time. His grandmother took him. And after the Bible class, she picked him up. She, she was anxious. She said, well, how did it go? And he said, it was all right. Did you like your teacher? Yeah. Well, who was she? I don't know, Grandma. It must have been Jesus, because that is all she talked about. That's all Paul wants us to talk about. You've got to be increasingly obsessed with Christ if you want to be increasingly possessed by him. You have to suffer with him who suffered for you, and you need to dwell on him who dwells in you. And finally, you must work for him who works in you. Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 29, To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul is saying that when he works for Jesus, he can literally feel Christ's energy in him. I don't feel Jesus alive in me when I'm just sitting around being a spiritual couch potato. I don't feel Jesus alive in me when I'm being passive and inactive. But when I am out there and I am serving and laying down my life for him, I feel his energy alive in me. How can you look like Jesus if you never suffer? And how can you look like Jesus if you never serve? So let me ask you again, if you could trade places right now with any person and, and be that person, would you really pick Jesus? I read about an amazing bike race in India. It's unlike any other bike race I've ever heard of. The goal of this bike race is to see who can go the least distance without falling off of their bike. They start the race, and if you fall off your bike or you put a foot down on the ground, you're out. So the goal is to see how slow you can go and still stay on your bike. And when the race is over, the person who has gone the least distance is the winner. You know what I thought when I heard that? I thought, I know too many Christians just like that. It seems to me that their goal is to see how they can stay in the race without having to go very far at all. How can I stay on the bike without having to move very much? That was never God's goal for your life. Look at how Paul described the race in Philippians chapter 3. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He doesn't sound like a couch potato. With all his heart, with all his might, with everything he has, he wanted to take hold of that for which Christ had taken hold of him. But look at what he said next in verse 15 of chapter 3 of Philippians. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. Are you taking a mature view of things? At the Alamo in Texas, on a wall, they have these portraits to remember the men who had fallen there. There is a place there as a portrait. And under the portrait is the name James Butler Bonham one of the Alamo's heroes. But underneath it, it it has this description. It says this, James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. This portrait that's above is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for their freedom. What did Jesus look like? I don't know. Did he have dark skin? Did he have long hair or short hair? Did he have a beard? Blue eyes, brown eyes? Was he tall? Was he short? Did he have a pot belly? I don't know. But I know he died for my freedom. And I know God's plan was to have all over the world a community of people just like you, just like me, that are looking so much more and more like him in the way that we live that a person could come up and say, you know, I have a good idea of what Jesus looks like. Now that is God's plan for you. Do not settle for anything less. We're going to sing a song of invitation this morning. If you have a decision to make, I want to encourage you to make that decision publicly.